So you think about Iceland, uh, think about many countries in Africa that were colonized. We got our independence at a, approximately the same time. So we're a very young democracy. The myth that Iceland has the oldest parliament and so forth, it's just a myth. It's not real because we were colonized. So we didn't have our independent uh, parliament or we couldn't develop our democracy. We were under the rule of not, uh, both Denmark and Norway. So we are what I, I define Icelanders as high-tech aboriginals in a positive sense, but it's very easy to abuse uh, primitive people. And so we are exactly in the same danger as many other primitive societies. We are still quite primitive, but nobody sees it because we're white <laughs> and we have lots of gadgets. Uh, so uh, I have been a part of a group of, for example, environmentalists that sent out an SOS call to the rest of the world for help because um, uh, it's easy to manipulate the people in power just like it is in every other country to look the other way, deregulate in the right places uh, and when you're dealing with global corporations for a nation with 315,000 people it's nearly impossible to win. So we've always been pawns of great powers, always. Uh, but. Our only blessing is that we've been isolated for a very long time. And thus the best qualities of the Aboriginal uh, are still quite close to us in time. So we still have some connection to nature uh, and we still appreciate as islanders uh, the importance of connecting with others, which I think is very important. And we're still that few that we can allow ourselves to do experimentation with our society. Because the, the overwhelming system uh, that is present in all countries uh, is not as complex and big as it is in most other places. Really? Uh, I have learned so much in the last um, maybe six years uh, about how the Icelandic society is. Um, even if I've always been an activist, I was not so deeply aware of uh, how things really work. Um, and uh, I think most people were not engaged before the crisis. And that is why, um, like, when Iceland was in, like, in 2008 or seven, Iceland was defined by the United Nations as the most developed country in the world. I do not know or understand how people can reach, make these categories. <laughs> They're very weird to me. Uh, I think that some societies, like, I think, for example, Mantragon is probably much more developed than Iceland was when it was defined as the most developed country in the world. Icelanders claim to be the happiest in the world, and I have never seen a sad lonely people anywhere in the world as they are here except maybe in some former Russian countries. Uh, so I mean all these global classification on how we're all the same and you can actually make a category on what happiness is, <laughs> it's just mm. bollocks. <laughs> Don't buy the bollocks. Uh, and uh, yeah so we, we've always uh, used more resources than we need. We have a very heavy ecological footprint um, because there are so many resources and we're so few. And once the, uh, what I call the, the sharks discovered us uh, and that they could actually grab stuff, um, we are in great danger of uh, resource depletion. And people don't understand, you know, how quickly it can happen. So, like now, we don't. We're no longer sort of under the. Uh, like first we had the Dan Norwegians and Danish, and then the Americans, uh, and now we have the Chinese. Uh, so we're always just a pawn unless we learn something very important and start to exercise something very important, which I think is the key for changing 
uh, the world and acquiring power back. And that is uh, for true self-sustainability to be the mantra and the execution of society. Because one of the reasons why our world is so uh, fucked up uh, is because uh, we're taking resources from one place to another where we could actually make the same stuff, you know, in harmony with the environment. And we could be, you know, self-sustainable with energy in Iceland, for example, and with food. We would not have to import anything except maybe fancy spice and, and, and a few other things. <laughs> uh, and we could even grow them ourselves in greenhouses. So, I mean, and every country could actually be self-sustainable. We've just been told that we need uh, out-of-season vegetables. We need to always have the same vegetables all year long, and that's unnatural, <laughs> uh, both for us and for those that are making it uh, in different places of the world. And I realized how much Koyanikatsky, how much out of uh, harmony our world had become when we had this uh, incredible volcanic eruption in Iceland. And that was the only thing in the world ever that managed to stop capitalism for a week. <laughs> and so uh, fl there were news about farmers in Kenya that uh, couldn't transport the tulips they were growing in Kenya to Holland. And the tulips wither away and die in a very short period of time. And if you think about destruction of resources, uh, a completely unnecessary process, which I think is the nature of capitalism, you know, in a really sort of common sense, uh, well, not common sense, in a really sort of, uh, this is a very good example of how insane capitalism has become and how insane and out of sort of uh, harmony with reality we are when you you encourage people to grow tulips in Kenya when they actually desperately need to be more self-sustainable with food <laughs> uh, and fly it over to the tulip country and you know both the energy that it takes to fly the tulips to Holland <laughs> uh, and the insanity about actually having somebody grow something that you will watch wither away and die in a few days is, is a world out of whack. <laughs> and I think self-sustainability um, is something we can achieve. We need to learn to, we need to learn best practices from other countries. And even if there's been either a lot of uh, negativity or uh, a lot of praise about Cuba, I think the most amazing stuff they did was that uh, when uh, the sanctions started, uh, every plot on earth was used to grow food. And so they didn't starve, uh, like was the intention to starve them to, uh, to uh, do what the US wanted them to do. So in a sense, the, uh, they have these thumbscrew on us, those that control things at the top. That is, and we experienced this very strongly in Iceland uh, when we were the nation actually refused to uh, take on an, an, a socialized private debt uh, in relation to one of the banks. And uh, we were told if we would not comply with the two colonist nations uh, that wanted us to pay, pay huge interest uh, on a low loan that the nation never agreed to. Uh, that we would become Cuba of the North, that nobody would want to do business with us and we wouldn't get loans and, and so forth. For me, that would have been great. <laughs> you know, we could maybe get out of this sort of uh, thumbscrew of having so much um, a corporate uh, interest invested in Iceland that we could not make independent decisions for the greater benefit of the nation uh, unless we would uh, be threatened with nobody actually wanting to um, um, either help us or do business with us. So we should not depend on other nations uh, for trade. Uh, and 
actually when you think about and it was a, a really beautiful documentary made uh, that put things into context uh, called the story of stuff and uh, you know I knew about these things but it was just done in such a, a clear comprehensive way that you could even show it to a kid and they would understand and start to think about stuff in a very different way and so if you buy something and you know it's too cheap then you should know that somebody's suffering for it either the planet or the people making it and if we just can raise you know the level of awareness a little bit uh, that would be very useful for the greater good and you have to understand that I don't consider myself an Icelander I know that uh, you know suffering in any part of the world is also my suffering but also any success in the world is also my success uh, so I'm committed to uh, and actually it might sound a little bit crazy to some people but I was granted a life-altering experience with uh, uh, the Holy Mamas of Sierra Nevada in Colombia and they uh, invited me to participate in a ritual in 1997 when I was there at the poetry festival uh, and the ritual a part of the ritual was to visualize in a thread uh, the earth in the future and uh, I saw a very clear vision that uh, the planet earth was smiling from within and then I knew that that was my mission in life <laughs> uh, and then they buried the thread and I made actually a really good uh, uh, connection with these amazing people and uh, my, my big uh, brothers um, and um, and then I knew I was on a clear path and if all of us would actually try to visualize how would we like to see the planet uh, and all of us who are on it be it human beings or any other life uh, if we can start to visualize this uh, in a clear way so that we know we're on the right track because if you know that the end result is something so beautiful I can't even describe the feeling when I had this vision it was just so profoundly beautiful uh, uh, that um, you know that all decisions are based on reaching this end goal if you know what I mean uh, then I think that we will move ahead a lot quicker it's important for people to understand that Iceland uh, is sort of like Grand Sicily like very many uh, African countries um, when they got their independence, who were the educated people? It was usually either the people that had been working with the colonists uh, or their relatives that were sent off to, let's say, France for higher education. Uh, and then they came and they were the bureaucrats that built up the country. <clears throat> and so they handed the resources and the wealth to themselves and their friends. And it was exactly the same in Iceland. Uh, those that treated us the worst were not the colonists, but Icelanders that were working for the colonists. Uh, and m very many people that got higher educations were friends and family to these people. So Iceland has been ruled by uh, sort of a Grand Sicily Mafia, which is called the Octopus, for a long time. And for Icelanders to break out of it, <clears throat> um, um, we needed something really big which was the crisis uh, and prior to the crisis uh, everybody was caught up in this delusion and this you know impossible dream that the breadcrumbs would roll over into their lap and they got more and more loans and uh, it was just like being in the end days of Rome or something uh, there was plenty of bread and circus <laughs> so we had the crisis uh, and something changed very quickly it happened very quickly so that people would actually sort of go back like in time like with values and what they would do with their time they would start knitting and making food from scratch and you know they sort of had to pull in um, knowledge that was almost gone from our ancestors you know grandmothers and so forth and for example, my generation, we don't know how to do anything, like, because my mother, she was rebelling against, uh, you know, the knowledge of my grandmother, if you know what I mean, because they wanted to be free, you know, to be capitalists, really. <laughs> uh, 
Uh, that was a lot of the women's liberation was actually hijacked by capitalists and, and that was sort of used against the greater good of everybody. Uh, and a lot of knowledge vanished. So people were sort of reclaiming this knowledge uh, and there were so many little communities created, like little groups that wanted to figure out what do we need to do in order to prevent this from happening and then people were also organizing, happening again, and people were organizing themselves for protests and and so forth and there were think tanks and, and uh, lots of activity going on, sort of a community-based activity and it felt great, it was just so awesome that you would go uh, I helped organize a few protests myself and I was in a think tank and, uh, you know, being a long time activist. And uh, it was just so great to see all these new people because uh, all activists know the feeling that they feel that no, like it's always the same people protesting about everything, <laughs> like professional protesters. Uh, and um, so... I was very optimistic uh, that we could actually get some changes done and, and uh, my pre sort of think tank um, realized that or we came to the conclusion that we needed to change the constitution and that people would need to know what was in the constitution in order to prevent politicians and others to uh, dishonor uh, our constitutional rights. Um, and uh, it's very easy if nobody knows what's in it. And so in this process, um, uh, sort of values that I think everybody feels in comfort, comfort with uh, became much more dominant than uh, values of, um, you know, a quick buck and get rich quickly and just get any stuff you see quickly, <laughs> uh, and sort of these uh, preconditioned needs that we are constantly fed with, that we need stuff, <laughs> uh, which we really don't. Um, and um, so during this time, uh, there was a really clear vision of what we wanted and what we didn't want. Uh, and I think this is very important. We all usually all know what's wrong, you know. Uh, but we don't know what we want instead. This is the most important question we need on an individual level and as society is to define where we're going. So a constitution, to write a new constitution or not even write it, to discuss it is probably a really good tool for any society, small or big, to actually do an exercise because then you have a discussion about who you are as a nation or a community and what is your social agreement. And the social agreement is the social agreement of the people. It is not the social agreement of those in power uh, or lawyers. Uh, and, uh, and so we did this. Uh, you know, well, you know, in the meantime, I sort of accidentally uh, fell into parliament. Uh, it's never been my intention and I, I um, uh, I'm very glad I did because I'm analyzing the belly of the beast from inside. I'm sort of inside the whale <laughs> and um, seeing if it is possible to change things from both sides. Uh, and uh, that was one of the conclusions as well from all the different grassroots groups that we needed to create a hit and run movement to go in and ensure that we would get a constitution written by and for the people of Iceland. And um, that was my main task. Uh, but in the meantime, I realized that, you know, a democracy, and I don't really think that we have proper democracies, and I don't think uh, it's a format that really works with all these isms. Uh, I mean, I think isms and ideologies that are supposed to be a patent uh, solution are the problem because they never take into account human behavior and human, uh, the human condition. And uh, so I realized that there are two very important pillars you have to have uh, in a healthy society. You have to have uh, transparency uh, towards the powerful and you have to have uh, privacy of the public. 
uh, to exercise democracy. And so you have to have strong initiatives and support for whistleblowers uh, to tell us if something's wrong within the systems that we have in place right now. And you have to have a very um, clear path of freedom of expression. Uh, and accessibility to, to information is very, very important as well. And like I have said many times, I think that the internet is sort of the last remaining free world that we can access as humanity and connect with each other and connect ideas and in order to move quicker. Uh, because I really feel that, you know, even if Iceland could be the ideal country and we could have all the best stuff, uh, that is not my agenda. My agenda is that uh, we do things hopefully right, um, like, with, uh, like with the Icelandic Modern Media Initiative, which I think is a really good uh, example on how we can do things right. Uh, and that can be an inspiration for others to work laws in that way, if we're still going to have uh, a concept of the rule of law, which I actually don't really believe in. Uh, you know, the more I study law uh, and see how they work and how they're made, I'm in the privileged position of actually seeing how th things are done from the inside, uh, the less I respect it. Uh, and the more I'm convinced that the laws are made to have reins and power over the 99% uh, to give the 1% more privileges. And I don't uh, endorse that sort of system. Well, Iceland is just like any other country. Uh, it's exactly the same power structure. So you have, um, you know, the a few families that run everything and they of course collaborate with international um, corporations uh, and you know international powers I mean we are a part of TISA for example which is a very bad um, agreement between sovereign states and corporations about giving corporations uh, that sort of power that they might be able to overwrite uh, the laws in each country uh, which is crazy uh, and this is just sort of happening in a complete um, lack of transparency. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, uh, Iceland, like I said, is like Grand Sicily. It is controlled by a mafia, and that mafia, of course, works with other mafias, which are, you know, the large corporations. And, you know, we actually, and this is the big tragedy, is that uh, before the crisis in Iceland, the IMF had nearly completely lost its role. It was directionless and and was sort of becoming redundant. And then we resurrected. Uh, we gave it a meaning again. And just look at what they've done in Greece. Um, I mean, they might not have been... I mean, they wanted to use Iceland as a poster child on how the IMF had changed. Uh, and like I always said to them when I would have meetings with them, yeah, okay, so you've changed, and that is why you're doing what you're doing in Greece. You know, that is... The old IMF is there. And um, and as you know, and I have serious problems with you know seeing Iceland as an isolated place. I mean, in the eyes, because we did so many things right just after the crisis, uh, there were high hopes in the world that we could be the model country, but we're not because we didn't change the system. The system. The system, and it's exactly the same system in every country, it is a system which uh, nourishes all the worst elements of human society. It's a system that pushes the people that acquire and thrive on power uh, to be at the top, and then the rest of the people willingly, without force, hand over their own personal power to these people. They just give it over. It's crazy. And it's been like this forever in human society. And I think the biggest, biggest question uh, that we need to find an answer to is how do we break this uh, repetitive pattern that happens through thousands of years in human history? How do we, you know, how do we analyze and figure out uh, this virus of human society? Because... Uh, if we don't, and I think that we might, we are coming up with answers, which is really nice. And the answers lie in small communities where people actually have 
a joint uh, cooperative uh, uh, sort of uh, responsibility together in holding that community together. Uh, and that was never something we worked on in Iceland. And so we just, we tried, we made some fixes, <coughs> uh, you know, uh, short term fixes that a new government could easily uh, reverse. And this is the problem also with democracy, is that people feel that uh, they ha that there is some power in choosing smooth talkers uh, into position to look after their interest, and then they're always undoing what the others are doing once they're there, which is insane. It is not for the benefit of societies. Uh, and uh, this whole idea of the left and right, uh, constant bickering and fighting about small things when the bigger issues are never touched and uh, and one is of course the depletion of resources on this planet and the fact that there are so many people that uh, you know live in complete lack uh, and you know they're they are starving they are ill there is like this huge Ebola epidemic in uh, one part of the world that nobody really cares about because like it seems like when we talk about the world different uh, African countries just they're not on the map you know they're just their lives are not as valuable as my life you know that is the reality we live in and so how do we change that and you know, what happened in Iceland is exactly like what happens always 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 after crisis is that the fundamental stuff that needs to be changed which is actually to legalize the transfer of power from the state to the people did not occur. It didn't happen. So, uh, and it was stopped last minute. We did a very nice constitution that, you know, uh, I would, uh, as a poet, weep when I would read the foreword to in the parliament chamber. It would sort of move me in a really deep way. I was really proud to be a part of that sort of social agreement. Uh, but we couldn't get it through, and we will never get that particular version through. It's not going to happen. What we can do, and I think is important, and this is the only reason why I'm, I'm supporting and the Pirates put uh, somebody in the committee to work on the, uh, uh, on the basis of the new constitution that is never going to be, is that I really want to make sure that there are two elements, that, or three elements, that I will fight for. Um, and I, we will hopefully get it through. One is the transfer of power, that we, we can call for national referendums. That's the first step. So we could have a national referendum on you know, greater power to the nation. Once we have this tool, it's, we can use it the way we like in order for a, a larger power transfer to the people. Uh, one is uh, similar Freedom of Information Acts like they have in the Swedish constitution, which is of highest order. Uh, and and then, of course, we have to make sure, since we are still with the IMF uh, in Iceland, even if they finish their mission, they're still very influential, is that we have to make sure that our resources uh, are in the ownership of the nation, that uh, it will not be pri privatized. Uh, so uh, if that can be achieved, then I think the crisis could have been utilized for something positive. We did not... Uh, imprison many of the bankers, uh, banksters like they are called now. Uh, but there have been, uh, they've all gone through trials. Uh, it's very hard to get them and that is what Eva Scholli warned us. It's going to be very expensive, very long, very complicated trials and uh, research uh, and investigation into what, you know, uh, their criminal behavior. The, and this is why I say the rule of law does not apply to the one percent because these are the very same people that we're putting on trial uh, and that will get very short sentences because they have an army of lawyers and they themselves advised on the laws and all our laws are so complicated uh, that it's easy to manipulate by those that know how to uh, go against what is the spirit of the law so they might be really? So there might be an agreement that these laws should also, uh, uh, you know, work for the one percent, but their lawyers interpreted it in such a way that they can find loopholes in it. So, <clears throat> um, 
Iceland is not, there is no such country in the world where you have a true democracy. It just doesn't exist. You might have pockets of uh, democracy. And I mean, democracy means rule of the people. So, you know, if you can see and point to me a democracy like Iceland or, you know, any country in the world that claims to be a democracy, please tell me because I haven't seen it. It is more like a dictatorship with many hats than true democracy. And just like all these other fake democracies, um, we have to get people in there, uh, like we're trying to do here. And we might or might not be successful, at least we know, you know, we have tried to see if we can fix it from inside, uh, the transfer of power to people. If it's not achievable, then you're not in a democracy. And the sooner you analyze, realize and acknowledge that that is a fact and start to build different types of communities, which should ideally be small, uh, then you're on the right track, I think. Um, I, th I don't think that there is going to be any one ideology that will be the ideology of uh, a transformative world. I think we will have many different types of societies. Like for example, there are always going to be people that like capitalism. So they can live in their own village. All the capitalists that are sort of exploiting each other, they can just live in one place. Go please to some island. Uh, and, uh, and then others that, you know, want to, you know, only eat uh, vegetables. They can be in one community, and those that want to live in, you know, experimentative uh, cooperatives, you know, eco villages or whatever, they can do that. And we have, we should have the freedom to choose in what sort of societies we live in. You know, if you want to have like old-fashioned family communities where you know uh, you don't segregate uh, uh, people by age. <laughs> This is the biggest accepted segregation in the world, is that uh, once you're old, you can just throw you in some institution. <laughs> and when you are a kid, you can also be thrown into some institution. <laughs> and so we can have a good life, you know, because we so much deserve it. I would need a manicure, please. <laughs> so it's, I don't know. So there is a saying that... Uh, there is tremendous power that lies within information. And those that have access to information are the powerful in the world. And so being a profound believer in that information should be free, and all information that should be in the public domain should be accessible to the general public. Um, I sat on a quest uh, like with figuring out you know, what sort of role should Iceland have after this miserable attempt to be the banksters nation in the world. <laughs> I mean, that was actually the true goal, to make Iceland into a financial center. Quite embarrassingly, I'm sorry. Uh, but uh, they had to learn the hard way, I guess. Um, so I was thinking, like, how could a nation resurrect out of this sort of really uh, embarrassing uh, crash? Uh, and I was really lucky to meet people that um, had actually come up with an idea um, uh, about how we could resurrect. So let's say that if Iceland would have been a financial center in the world, it would sort of have been like a tax haven nation. You know, like in the city of London is the biggest tax haven, so Iceland could be sort of uh, a tax haven. Uh, and uh, tax havens thrive on secrecy and laws that protect uh, people from, you know, uh, having access to information that really should uh, be in the public domain. It's a very big problem because a lot of our resources are moved into tax havens. Anyway, so uh, there was a guy called John Perry Barlow who is a co-founder of an organization called the EFF, the Electronic Frontier Foundation. Uh, and uh, they are the sort of our watchdog in on the internet and, and it's so important and most people don't understand why it's important. It's important because nearly all our data uh, in societies that have uh, digital infrastructure and uh, good access to internet, everything about us, everything who we are, 
and how we communicate and our medical records and you know our letters to our lawyer and you know everything is digital now yet uh, uh, states and international organizations have failed to ensure that we have the same that our digital information and knowledge and um, communications is considered as sacred as it is when we write a physical letter or when our doctor writes a physical receipt for medicine or diagnosis of an illness. Um, and so this guy was here in Iceland just after the collapse, uh, giving a speech. Uh, I couldn't go because I was organizing one of the big protests uh, in the wake of the crisis. But a year later I was invited to the same event to speak, because I was the only geek in parliament. And just after or before I was speaking, there were a couple of guys from an organization called Wikileaks, uh, at the time completely unknown organization, today a very known or organization. Uh, and what they do uh, is that they created a platform where a source uh, could leak information about criminal behavior of states uh, or you know stuff that really we should have access to like war crimes and corporate crimes and environmental crimes and so forth without uh, being sort of the source could provide this information to this website and nobody could track where that person came from and Wikileaks had also managed to do something else which was they managed to keep the information then they then published uh, online no matter what sort of attacks they received like uh, Church of Scientology you know went on a legal suit against them and lost one of the Icelandic banks went in uh, a battle to get the material uh, there was a, one of the loan books of one of the collapsed banks they lost biggest bank in Switzerland went in a legal suit against them and lost so they had figured out, and the reason why they were so strong in this regard was that they had figured out where the best um, legal environment was in different countries to protect different aspects of this service. It was sort of like they were the sort of the middleman that uh, received the envelope and gave it to the journalist uh, in a sort of a digital way. Really? So I was quite impressed with them, uh, and uh, they were talking, they carried on with the idea from John Perry Barlow about that Iceland could become a transparency haven, a safe haven for freedom of information, expression and speech. Uh, and I thought, wow, that's a, that's a great idea. So I approached them afterwards and uh, said, simply, let's do this. And so this was in December 2009 and uh, just after crisis uh, and we started immediately to work on this and they had access to lots of really great journalists and academians and lawyers and we actually did something that had never been done before and this was really awesome and I really encouraged others to do the same other nations and particularly small nations uh, so what we did was that we started on a quest to look for all the best laws in the world that will protect freedom of information, expression and speech, uh, with regard to the fact that we live in a, a world where information and stuff like this doesn't have any borders anymore. So there are, like the jurisdiction thing is uh, uh, quite different than when it was when anyone had printed uh, material, for example. And we got some really amazing people to help us so we had somebody in the EU Parliament to look at the EU laws to see you know uh, what we had to keep in mind in order to make sure that it wouldn't clash with EU laws uh, and we sort of used the uh, element of the um, sort of hacktivist or an activist uh, you know you've seen how they sometimes stand when the police is trying to stop them from you know, uh, being somewhere, they sort of dance around them and it never becomes uh, aggressive except from the police. Uh, so we're sort of dancing around this whole legal environment uh, and figuring out how we could go sideways in in order to ensure these freedoms. And, and we wrote it. Uh, 
together. And okay, so globalization and language is often, you know, considered a problem, but sometimes it's an incredible asset. So we wrote this together, people from very many different parts in the world, at the same time, in something called Etherpad, which is um, similar to Google Docs. Uh, and so we could all be writing in it together. Uh, and it was just such an incredible feeling. Uh, and then it was written in English. Um, after extensive research, we wrote it in English together that one night, uh, never forget it because uh, uh, we had a heavy deadline and they weren't doing anything. So I said, okay, nobody's leaving this room until we've done it. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, it worked. Uh, so, um, and then we translated to Icelandic uh, with the help of the parliament. <clears throat> but you can, of course, you know, there are many varieties of how you can do this, but imagine environmental law, for example, or laws how we can tackle Monsanto or, you know, many of these large corporations we're dealing with. If we can work together as a force of uh, experience from various countries and expertise to create a really good shield to protect us from them before they advance. And that was the key to IMI, the Icelandic Modern Media Initiative. And that was... We knew what would be happening, you know, all of us knew what Snowden would reveal many years later, or at least, you know, me and the people from Wikileaks, we were aware of that. Uh, and many of the people in that community were aware of what Snowden revealed a long time ago. Uh, so we were preemptive. We struck them before. So imagine like countries that are going to get fracking into their home turf soon. People need to hurry up to write laws to protect it before it happens. And this is the thing that we uh, need to learn from this experience because the reason why I got it through the Icelandic parliament in the end was because we could work it so fast, but in a really deep way. We really analyzed which laws we could model uh, the Icelandic laws on. The reality was that I came from the tiniest party in the parliament uh, and you know you usually don't have a lot of power when you come from tiny parties uh, so I you know I had to figure out a way to get this through the parliament and so the best way was to make a parliamentary resolution and parliamentary resolutions is something that tasks a government to do something and so I had to make sure that I would get um, you know, as many people in the parliament to be on it. And I didn't know nothing about these processes. Uh, you know, there were no politicians in my political movement. We were just like, you know, okay, <laughs> uh, let's just, you know, do things and see what happens. And so what I did was that I just applied, and this is another thing people need to understand about what uh, happens in the, the process in parliaments and so forth. The reason why you get something done is that you have to be very, very good at selling your idea, you know, to inspire people to think, hey, this is a good idea, I want to be on it. Uh, and I somehow, I had so much faith in this, I managed to sell it to every party and the most influential people in each party, so they all had their name on it. And then I got it through the parliament with an overwhelming, like everybody said yes, except one person that abstained because uh, he was, wasn't aware of what this was about. Uh, I had even workshops in the parliament with people from Wikileaks uh, to explain what it was because it was so abstract. You know, I hardly knew what it was myself trying to explain it in the beginning because it was so, it was such a big vision. Uh, and then the miracle happened and that was that uh, we managed to get the ministers to work on it. So they started to write the laws. Uh, and that is still happening. We haven't, these are huge laws that we want to change. Like we want to write really good uh, uh, whistleblowing laws and we want to make the source protection laws really clear uh, for public uh, servants and so forth. And, uh, and we're studying now, uh, you know, how to protect intermediaries, how to get rid of data retention, how to ensure net neutrality and all these different things. And the only reason I decided to go back into the machine was that I wanted to ensure that these laws would be made so that I can retire after this term. Because nobody should be inside for too long. Uh, it's uh, uh, dangerous even for the strongest people 
that you become assimilated in the system. Really? And so imagine if we can do this to tackle the, the legal jungle. Uh, if we can build on best practices in laws from other countries and be ahead of them. Like when crisis hits, we always know, like we can analyze and we can see which countries are, you know, categorically in the most danger of going, you know, in deep crisis. And then if we are ready with something that gives people more power or more accessibility to information or uh, encourages whistleblowers to come forward or makes sure that you can never take down news, uh, then we have a better chance of, you know, installing this new system that we need to build, you know. Um, and that is why I dedicate my life to two things. It's uh, the Icelandic Modern Media Initiative or the International Modern Media Institute to work on these issues and unify people about these issues if possible. Uh, and to train people in, uh, lawyers for example in Iceland need to be trained in tackling laws uh, that deal with the 21st century, with a complete globalization. <clears throat> and, um, and then the other task is actually exactly the stuff you're addressing with this film. And that is how can we start to have a really clear narrative about where we want to go as humanity. And these are my two tasks. Uh, and uh, I think I can be of most use for, um, there are so many great environmental activists, there are so many great activists that are bringing forward financial reform and all these different things. Uh, but it's going to be harder to make it if we don't have a clear path of sharing this knowledge. And that's why I am so uh, confident that uh, I am of better use and of most use right now in the space where I am in, in regard to specializing in these laws or, you know, this activism. And together the tribe, there is a beautiful tribe out there that many people don't know about. And that tribe is not in one place. Uh, it's the hacktivist tribe, the people that are using the internet to connect people and then use the internet as a tool to ensure that our communities, the physical communities, can uh, evolve. But it's one, you know, final thing that I think is very important to know that uh, it's not worth to have any sort of revolutions unless we have something uh, to put in, to replace the system. And we have to really work on that very quickly. And I know we can because I'm discovering people from all over the world that are actually doing exactly the same thing because we are all connected. Um, actually, what is sort of happening, you know, even if not all the laws have been put into place, um, uh, there are already lots of companies uh, and activists and all sorts of people coming with their data to Iceland. And it's sort of good that it's happening as it is, uh, in a gradual way, because hopefully one of the most important thing is to do a test, you know, uh, if the laws are okay. Uh, so we need guinea pigs <laughs> uh, to see if the law holds. Um, to Before we start to get lots and lots of uh, uh, people and organization to host their data in Iceland, we have to make sure that it's safe. Uh, and uh, so it's sort of gradually, because it's taking way too long, I don't have patience for this, we're running out of time, we'll, hopefully some other country will actually just have done it before us, because, you know, if we're too slow, somebody else will pick it up. And actually I saw, and that was quite nice news, uh, that uh, Eritrea is, uh, they have taken the Icelandic Modern Media Initiative as it is, and are starting building on it uh, to uh, uh, build on a new model of prosperity. So, I mean, it's uh, what it would do for Iceland is that it would, and, and you know, if people just understand that we, they have to act fast, is that w it could make us uh, a really good central for hosting sensitive information. Like, for example, imagine all the documents that go to Amnesty International or Human Rights Watch or various other different organizations that receive a lot of very sensitive material. 
uh, they need to have a safe place. Even if they will never publish this material, you don't want the people that are trusting them with this stuff to be compromised. Uh, and so um, I was sort of hoping that Iceland, or the vision is that Iceland could become the place where you would host information that needs to be uh, available uh, and accessible. Um, and that could be material from investigative journalists, uh, from whistleblowers, uh, and from human rights organizations, from bloggers, alternative media, and so forth. Uh, and it would be really awesome if it could be a center for that sort of activity because we're so few and we need more sort of we need more people here uh, to have more presence uh, that uh, care about these issues uh, so we can advance. So, but I want to see this happening in every country. Uh, we should have uh, a safe haven for these fundamental democratic pillars in the entire world. Uh, and so that was the aim of IMI, just to be a seat that would then, you know, grow and the the um, uh, it would sort of flow all over the world um, and I'm particularly fond of the idea that you know in Eritrea you know I've never been there uh, some people are trying to put this through uh, as their model uh, and um, and so for me it is a proof that, uh, that you never know who you will inspire or how uh, you just have to go and put make your ideas available and if they're useful then somebody else will pick them up you know <laughs> no I mean what happens and I've, I've created two political movements you know in five years and uh, you know, I, I, I based it on the, uh, you know, horizontal movement model uh, in Argentina where there would be no leaders and, and you know, try to use modern technology with the Pirate Party to involve people in uh, policy making and decision making and, um, and it's the same problem as with all parties, it doesn't matter what it's called or where it comes from, it's just a matter of time how long it goes into that same uh, human condition like I talked about earlier uh, and so you have if you have the possibility of power and money you just get the worst elements from people it's astonishing and how quickly it happens so uh, parties become like cults you know there is a power concentrate you know with the first people or the people that are active and then it's going to be harder and harder to crack through that power structure. You know, no matter what, how open you want to be, it just sort of happens. It's very weird. So I'm, I'm confident that the party structure is uh, dangerous to the concept of democracy, uh, the rule of the people. Uh, and uh, also it's very difficult to leave the cult. Like, you know, or, you know it's sort of like the Catholic Church or something. Uh, and uh, um, so the parties and the politicians are not the vehicle. Uh, however, I think it's important to, uh, like while we're in this state, and this is a huge problem, we have to be aware of this, especially uh, in the West. And that is when people completely lose trust in the state. Uh, and I'm saying this even as a pragmatic anarchist, because I'm pragmatic. Once there is a complete distrust in the state, the worst people, the uh, populists and the nationalists, they have a vacant space to go into. And this happened before World War II, and it's happening right now. So we better hurry. Uh, if we're going to have, you know, any sort of alternative system. Uh, we really need, like, those of us that, everybody that, you know, if anybody hears this, what I'm saying is that we are running out of time. Uh, we don't want World War III. <laughs> uh, we don't want 
to finish the resources. We are running out of planet. Do we want riots before we have a new system? No, because they're just those in power are just going to hurt the people in the riots. There's not going to be any trans transfer of power, you know, between a few individuals. It's not going to be the solution. So, um, you know, I have reached the conclusion that, like, from being a, a part of it, you know, I am a part of it, uh, uh, and I, I sense the less and less trust and respect to the state, then where are we going to transfer this trust and respect? Um, are we going to the next, like, mini Hitler? Or, you know, is there going to be a Mussolini again? Or, I mean, they're already coming out of the woodworks. And I, I don't want to encourage that. And at the same time, instead of that, I want to encourage people to come up with alternatives. And they are already coming up. We have, uh, we need to test liquid democracy. We have to test eat democracy. We have to test uh, cooperatives uh, and various different types of models. You know, like in in cities, for example, people say, "Oh, there's a big. We can't. This country is too big to change." Uh, I don't agree with that. You just you break it up so you have a smaller um, communities. So let's say the neighborhood where I live. If that could be, you know, have its sort of own cooperative bank and, you know, we could share stuff within that community. There are already that sort of sharing uh, platforms of, you know, if I want to borrow something, I can write about it in a web-based community thing or, you know. In the, in the end, uh, from being inside the system, uh, I'm confident that the system is broken, we need to zero it, but before we zero it uh, and bring in the new hardware, we have to have something to replace it with. And so I, I call upon everybody uh, that has any ideas uh, to sit down and think about it and also talk about it with friends, family, uh, and acquire more information and then actually we are now saturated with information to sit down and either verbally talk about it or write it down or speak it in a video camera and then we can start to collect these stories uh, and we are already doing it the the world is connecting all these little oases like Iceland is in a sense a little bit of an oasis in some regards and in other places there are all these little oases and soon they will start to connect and uh, that's when we have the new system Hello!